So, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ahmaduhu wa usalli ala Rasulil Kareem. Amma ba'd, fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We ask Allah's help to, inshallah, open up the Qur'an to our understanding. And uh, hold on one second. So, بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لا ميم غلبة الروم The Romans have been defeated. So now let us first uh, discuss this issue of who is a room being mentioned in Quran. I think there is a perception that Romans mean all Europeans. This may be true in the Hadith literature. As we will look at the Hadith literature, it may be true in the Hadith literature. But it is not true in the Quran. Because when the Quran says the Romans were defeated, did it mean that the Persians came and defeated all of Europe? No. As I showed in the telegram. If uh, we can get the telegram out. We can also see other pictures. Over here, this blue part is the Roman, uh, is the Byzantine Empire. And Iran is connected to so the borderline is Persian. But you still had the, the Franks, which is the Anglo-Saxon American civilization, partly, uh, they were still there, and all these other civilizations that you see there, they were still, they were the, the Celtics of Britain were there, the Saxons were there, as you can see in this picture, if you look to the north where British is, uh, you'll see the Celtics. So, by the Romans being defeated, it did not mean the Europeans were defeated. It meant this particular kingdom was defeated. And this kingdom has certain qualities, has certain attributes. Uh, let me explain it to you this way. And we can probably, inshallah, with this example, understand it better. The British Empire had certain attributes. Then those attributes of the British Empire were transferred to the US. And these same attributes of Ju the Judeo-Christian civilization perhaps will be transferred to the next superpower like Israel, for example, okay? So what is it that made these people from the Quranic exegesis perspective from the Quranic perspective, what is it that made the Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire, sorry, what made them Rome, specifically Rome? Now, before I go there, let us uh, first uh, discuss the word Rome in the Hadith literature as a general understanding. The word room in the Hadith literature seems to be discussing the whole, uh, the whole of the Euro and even Eurasia, part of Eurasia. And you'll see this uh, when we discuss uh, this further, if we get a chance today to go into some of the more technical aspects of the word Roman and who they are, okay? Because the Romans, uh, they in the Byzantine, they also controlled part of Asia, Asia Minor, Turkey, Constantinople. So it was not just European. It was this whole uh, area of the Caucasus and the Balkans and uh, parts of Europe. Okay, so now let's look at uh, the Tafsir literature on this issue. 
when we pick up the, for example, the Ummahat al-Tafsir, the mothers of Tafsir, okay? And when we pick up, pick up the Ummahat al-Tafsir, and when we look at the word room in Quran, when we look at the word room in Quran, it is not talking about all of Europe. It is talking about a specific empire. Okay. So this is the first, I think, mistake that happens in the minds of the people. Uh, if also, if I went online and just, if I just Googled, for example, uh, Byzantine, uh, if I just typed in Byzantine, Empire. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find a map that also shows you the Persian Empire in relationship. So So you can see the Persian Empire is in the yellow, and then the, the Byzantine Empire is in the red, and they occupy parts of Africa, they part, occupy parts of Asia, they also occupy parts of Europe. So they weren't European as such, okay? They occupied many different territories, and that's what an empire is. An empire, by definition, is a government that has many states in many parts of the world coming together. Now, I'm going to discuss the word empire if I get a chance in more detail. Um, so, as you can see, they had parts of Africa, they had parts of Asia, they had parts of Europe. And within Europe, they didn't have all of Europe. As you can see, this majority of the Europe was not in their control majority of it was not in their control. As you can see, the Salves and the Slavs and the Brit British and the Franks and the Gaul, which is Germany, which is also, by the way, Gaul is mentioned in the Bible, with Gog Magog. So there's a relationship between Gaul as the brother of Gog Magog in the Old Testament. Okay, but One day I'm going to do a, a pretty thorough discussion on Gog Magog in the Old Testament soon. Actually, I intend to do that. And uh, I intend to talk about Gog Magog in the Old Testament and the warnings given to them. Uh, but anyway, we'll, when that time comes, then we'll deal with that. But over here, I wanted this to be clear that Rome does not mean European. And when it does not mean European specifically in the Quranic terminology of the word. But it may mean European in the Hadith literature, as we will see. Okay, so now these two things have to be separated. I'll give you a very good example of, of this, uh, where the Quran mentions, there's many examples of this, where Quran mentions something, the same word is used in Hadith literature, the same word is used in the Quranic literature, and they have two different distinct meanings. For example, jihad, if you pick up, and let me just show you so everybody's clear on this, okay? If you go to uh, the Hadith literature, and you pick up, for example, Sayyid Bukhari, okay? So this is Sayyid Bukhari, and these are the different chapters within Sahih Bukhari. Okay, and uh, within this, if you go to, hold on one second. Okay, if you go to the Kitab al-Jihad, 
the book of jihad. The book of jihad here is not talking about any other, it's not talking about jihad with wealth. It's not talking about jihad of any other sort, except what? The physical jihad that Quran calls what? Qital. The Quran calls the physical jihad qital. And the hadith literature calls the physical jihad, what? It calls the physical jihad, jihad. If you look at the Quran, for example, uh, let me just allow some people in quickly. If you look at the Quran, for example, just as in Surah Luqman, in fact, I'll show you this verse right now so that everybody is clear on this and its different uh, levels of its use. If you go to Surah Luqman, And if your parents do jihad against you, that you make shirk over which you have no knowledge, then don't obey them. So the word jihad used in Quran, okay, number one means any type of struggle, even by a non Muslim. Number two, what? The word for jihad that's used in the hadith literature for jihad is the Quran uses the word qital. Over here, without giving reference, I'll just tell you the ayat. For example, uh, Allah, yuhibbul ladhina fi Allah loves those people who fight in his path. In the hadith literature, it'll be called jihad. But over here, wa in, uh, then in another place, don't say the people have been killed in the path of Allah. The physical jihad. That they are dead. Don't even think in another ayah, Allah says, the people have been killed in the path of Allah. Meaning the qatalu wa qutilu. This is the wordings of Quran. The physical jihad, the Quranic terminology is qital. And Quran uses the word jihad, which in Hadith literature, when the word jihad is used, if you're a muhaddis and you use the word jihad, mostly what will come to your mind is only one idea of jihad, which is the qital fi sabilillah, fighting in the path of Allah. If you're a student of Quran and you're reading Quran and the Quranic terminology, the word jihad will become broader. And in the Hadith literature, the word jihad will become specific. Same thing with the word munafiqun. The Quran, the, the Hadith literature considers it alamatul munafiqin, the signs of a munafiq. When he talks, he lies, right? Etc., etc. But the munafiq of the Quran is somebody different. He's the person who accepts Islam with the intent of not believing in Islam to hurt Islam. That's a munafiq in the Quran. But in the hadith literature, munafiqeen or the, 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 the signs of who's a munafiq and the types of munafiq become much more broader. This is inherent. In the same way, when you're looking at certain words in the hadith literature and you're looking at certain words in the Quranic literature, you have to be mindful that they don't always necessarily correlate to equal to the same thing. They don't. And, and this is a great miracle because the Prophet ﷺ had his own personality. He had his own language. And the Quran is its own language. It's from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it has its own specification, its own language, its own uh, you know, style and asloob of talking, which is different from the Hadith literature. And you can actually use these examples, hundreds and thousands of them, literally. Like I can give you, just to mention as an example, the word used in Hadith literature is niya, intention. Quran doesn't use the word niya. Quran uses the word ikhlas. Mukhlisina lahuddin. Quran uses the word ikhlas 
as the quality of niyyah, the quality of intent. But the word used in hadith is niyyah. If you pick up the first chapter of Riyadh al-Salihin or Mashkat al-Masabih, you will see all the hadith on niyyah. But the Quranic terminology, and you'll notice uh, Imam Nawi, if I remember correctly, in the, in the, because Imam Nawi, for every hadith chapter, he first quotes ayat. So which ayah did he quote for the chapter of Niyah? The Mukhlisina Lahud Deen. You have ikhlas in the deen. Different words, different aspects. And like this, you can find this kind of like duality between hadith and Quran at many, many levels. That the Quran uses one word, hadith literature is using another word. And room has, happens to be one of those. Where when Allah is talking about a room, he's talking about a specific empire with specific qualities, which is what makes the believers happy. Which we'll talk about that in a second. A room is not talking about a continent in the Quran. It's talking about a empire that has control of Asia, Asia Minor, Africa, all of these areas. So this is the first point I wanted it to be clear, that sometimes when people are looking at the Hadith literature, and then they're looking at the Quran, they're not able to understand how the asloobs of the Quran are different from the asloob, meaning the style of conveying a message, is sometimes different in Hadith literature than it is in the Quran. Quran makes sometimes something, something very specific. Sometimes Allah mentions something general, but it is specific. I, just to like as a subject so that this issue is clear, that this does happen in different shapes and forms. Let me give this example also. Okay. So let's go to the Quran and I'll give you one. You know, in fact, this is the example that I'm about to show you is the one Imam Shafi uses in his book, uh, Ar Risala. In his book, Ar Risala, Imam Shafi uses this example. It's a very good example. Okay. Uh, over here. وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ And when it is said to them, Aminu, believe, kama amin nas like the people have believed. Imam Shafi in his book, Ar Risala, says very clearly, this is not people, this is the Sahaba. So the correct translation, meaning the specific translation would be, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ When it is said to them, Aminu, believe, kama amin nas like the companions of the Prophet ﷺ have believed, should we believe as the fools have believed, meaning the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes a word is used in Quran that has a, a, one of its synonymous, you can say, words. Uh, for example, let me give you an example of that also, so that people can appreciate that the intricacies of uh, of the Quran and its uh, form of dialogue. In ayah number 143, in the last part of this ayah, Allah says, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعْ إِمَانَكُمْ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not going to waste your iman. Meaning what? The prayers that you had done before the change of the qibla and the prayers that you do after the qibla, Allah is not going to put them to waste. Uh, and the translation here, and Allah would not let your faith go in waste. Waste. Okay. So because the people were asking the question, what about the sahaba who died? before the change of the Qibla? What about the people that had done all these prayers before the Qibla? So Allah responded, وَمَا كَانَ اللَّهُ لِيُضِيعْ إِمَانَكُمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not waste your iman. Meaning, specifically, your salah. Your salah would not go into zero just because the Qibla changed. Okay? So there are many examples like this where a word in Quran and a word in Hadith literature and words within Quran sometimes have different uh, aspects to it, like the word nas, mankind, for the companions of the Prophet, specifically. Okay. 
uh, Brother Feraz, uh, go ahead. Uh, I think you can ask the question, inshallah, I'll try to answer. Brother Feraz? Oh, I think I have to. Uh, Brother Feraz, can you can you speak or you can't speak? Okay. Anyway, we'll continue. Or is it that? Uh... Uh, something wrong with the mic. Let me check quickly. I think, uh, can someone say something to me? So someone else maybe? So I can see if it's my mic because my mic seems to be okay. Or, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam. Yes. Okay, so I was able to hear the brother who said salams to me. So I think we're okay. So, bismillah, alhamdulillah. Okay. So now we're clear on what points. Room is not, room, a room in Quran is not and could not be Europe as a whole. Why? Because the Byzantine Empire occupied only a portion of Europe, occupied a portion of Asia Minor, occupied a portion of Africa. They were never Roman in the sense of being European. The, in fact, the Franks, the, another kingdom by the side of the uh, Byzantine Empire was just as big, and they were part of the Romans. So this is very important. And just uh, for the people that came later, I'm going to show you this again, is that the Byzantine Empire, if you look here, uh, this blue part at the right side, or maybe to your left side, is the Byzantine Empire that occupies Africa, Asia, and most of what is today Europe was not even part of uh, Europe. We can't see, sir. Oh, you cannot see? Okay, okay. Uh, let me see. Um, so here is an example that I was using. And this is the situation at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay? Uh, so, and division line between East and West, if you look at this line also, so Byzantine was always part of East, okay? Uh, historically. And it didn't include, include the Salves. It didn't include the Frank, which or the Anglo-Saxon, the British. It didn't include any of these uh, races that are also known as European, uh, that are also part of the European civilization. So this is the Byzantine Empire. And so when Quran is saying, Rum, the Quran is not talking about a continent. But the Quran is in fact talking about the empire. Okay. So now let's go back to the Quran here. The Romans have been defeated. Which Rome? The empire. What is special about why is Allah talking about this empire? Why not about any other empire? Why not give prophecy that such and such thing will happen? There are so many empires. Why not any other empire? Why this empire? Okay, so now for that, we can go into the Hadith literature to maybe get an idea of questions that are not answered in the Quranic literature. But let's see first what Allah is saying in the Quran. Fi adna al-ard, in a land nearby the earth. Again, here's a good example. Fi adna al-ard, in a land near uh, the earth, meaning the uh, this is near Jerusalem. I don't want to. I would go into the details of this, but I'm going to leave it for now. And after their defeat, meaning the Byzantines, they will what? They will be victorious. 
in a few years, three to nine years, they will be victorious. Okay. Um, yeah, three to nine years, they'll be victorious. Lillahi al-amru min qabl for Allah. And this is the now the key part. This is very key now to understanding the text. What is Allah saying? Lillahi al-amru min qabl. For Allah is the affair before. Wa min ba'd and after. Wa yawma idhin and on that day yafrahul mu'minun. And on that day, the believers will rejoice. Now, a few questions pop up. Why does Allah say before and after? Before what and after what? And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to give the prophecy only for the purpose of saying this is the truth, then why does Allah say, وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَهُ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ on that day, the believers will be so happy. Faraha is actually the highest level of happiness, rejoicing. If you notice the translations, they'll use the word rejoice, celebrate, and to rejoice. Why the Quran said something? Now, was the Byzantine Empire not doing evil things? Were they not unjust? Didn't they fight uh, wars that were unjust? Why the Muslims felt something towards them? Why Abu Bakr has to place a bet uh, on their side? Let's continue. Bi Nasrillah. By the Nusra of Allah, the help of Allah. Yansuru man yasha. And he helps whoever he likes for whatever he intends. Rahim. He's the one who has authority and he's merciful. Then Allah continues to make, say this is a promise. Allah. What is this promise? لا يخلف الله وعده, and Allah will not betray his promise. ولكن أكثر الناس لا يعلمون, but most people do not know. Now, what is the promise? The promise is that the Romans will defeat the Persians, okay, وَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ In the Qur'an, it doesn't mention Persians. It only says they will defeat the ones who defeated them in three to nine years. And لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلِ For Allah is the affair from before, and for Allah is the affair after. One meaning could be the two battles, the battle in which they lost and the battle in which they won. When you're looking at the specific uh, situation of what was happening in the hadith literature, then you will say, "Lillahi al-amru min qabl." For Allah was the affair when they lost, and wa min ba'd, and afterwards when they will be victorious. This is Allah's affair. When you're looking at the hadith literature, if you're looking only at the ayat of Quran, which is what Imam Shawli al muhaddis Delbi in his Fawzul Kabir, Fiyasul Tafsir, he talks about. If you're looking only at the verses of the Quran, it seems to indicate that just as they were, they had victory before, they will have victory after in the future. And the believers will rejoice. And this is a promise from Allah. Now, let me now go back to these verses. In a few years, لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَمِنْ بَعْدُ وَيَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَفْرَهُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ بِنَصْرِ اللَّهِ By the Nusra of Allah, يَنْصُرُ مَنْ يَشَاءُ Allah helps whoever He wills. وَهُوَ الْعَزِيزُ الرَّحِيمُ And He's Al-Aziz Al-Rahim. وَعَدَ اللَّهِ Allah's promise is done. لا يخلف الله وعدا However much you may see the times and the situation, but this is what's going to happen is what Allah said. But most people will not know the truth of things or know the reality of things. You look at the apparent things, how much strong this is and how, who's, you know, the apparent things. And they are about what is to come after غافلون, or about the hereafter, they are غافلون. Both meanings are correct. Meaning what will come after in the future or 
what will come after in the future in the, in the time of the prophet or what will come after in the future after the time of the prophet or what will come akhira in terms of the hereafter they don't see the akhira okay all three meanings are correct okay now what can we now let's go to the uh, the tafsirs okay uh, let's go to the tafsir literature to learn some inshallah additional lessons that we can maybe benefit from this is in tafsir tabari okay and, uh, and i'm reading from here can al muslimun yuhibbuna an taghlib al rum ahl al kitab what has a room been called a uh, room is called can al muslimun because the muslimun yuhibbuna they loved an taghlib al rum ahl al kitab that room become dominate what is their quality for which the muslims wanted them to dominate over the persians what is the main quality that they had Okay, the main quality they had is that they were Ahlul Kitab. And you will find this in every single major tafsir. This point is made, it's a common point between all the tafsirs. And that is that room was preferred by the Muslims because they were Ahlul Kitab. Okay, after all, Ahlul Kitab also gave Muslims shelter in Ethiopia. Okay. وَكَانَ الْمُشْرِكُونَ يُحِبُّونَ أَن تَغْلِبُ الْأَحْلُ الْفَارِسِ and this is because the idol worshippers they they loved that they would be given victory the people of persia would be given victory because they were the people of the idols and this was then mentioned to abu Bakr, meaning these verses and he placed a bet okay and so the story continues uh that uh, how this bet was placed i'm not going to go into that but my only point is that the reason in every single tafsir if you go to for example uh instead of imam tabari uh if you use ibn kathir for example uh Exactly the same words. The main quality, the main quality is a strong power that is an empire that is not Judeo-Christian civilization, but they're Ahlul Kitab in the sense that they are, they are not Judeo-Christian, which makes them secular, okay? This is the only way that they can be Judeo-Christian. But they are from the Ahlul Kitab. They're from the people of the book, and they're true to their book. And I give, you know, in, in Islamic law, the example of this in, in another way, okay? And that is, that it's the same reason you're allowed to marry a Christian lady when Islam is strong or when Islam is getting strong. Why can you marry a true Christian lady? Not any, not, not the lady who goes to McDonald's or the lady, you know, if you think McDonald's is Ahlul Kitab, I don't know how many people have this silly opinion, think that you can eat from McDonald's because it's Ahlul Kitab. That's, you know, McDonald's is not Ahlul Kitab. Anyway, that's a longer discussion we need to have because what you eat is so important. It's so important. And I'm going to bring on, inshallah, one brother who is an expert uh, of this issue uh, one of these days, inshallah, soon, and talk about this because what we eat and, 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 and my point being that uh, Judeo-Christian civilization does because you got Judeo-Christian civilization it promotes liberalism. Ahlul Kitab are not going to promote liberalism. The Judeo-Christian civilization, which we've discussed in detail so many times now that I'm not going to show those same verses over and over again because I've already done that. 
The Jews and the Christians will never be happy with you. Those are the people who are for liberalism and ultimately fascism, which is what you find in Ukraine. Liberalism leads to fascism. This is another whole subject which uh, I will go into at another time. But the Judeo-Christian civilization versus a civilization that the prophet and his companions can identify because the Byzantine Empire existed at the time of the Prophet. And their Aqidah at that time and their Aqidah today is the same Aqidah, hasn't changed. It's not like Catholicism that's changing every two years to become more liberal. Okay, The Eastern Orthodox Church would never recognize a male-to-male -male marriage, unlike the where Catholicism is going and where the Protestants are going. And one thing that you have to know uh, about the Ahlul Kitab, about the people of the book. Uh, let me mention this also uh, before we go further, because it's a very important point and uh, I would like to uh, discuss it, inshallah. And it will help us understand certain nuances. Uh, if I can find it, inshallah, if Allah allows me to find it. And from amongst those people, the people of the book who say we are Christians, not Judeo-Christian, not you will be guided if you're Jew or Christian, okay? No, only those who say, those who say we are Christian, we took their covenant. They forgot a big portion of what they were reminded of. So between the Christianities, we provoked enmity between them. Anger and enmity. Meaning different Christian groups angry with one another till the day of judgment was so and soon Allah will tell them of the things that they used to invent. What is this talking about? What does it mean? It means there will be different Christian groups. The Catholics will hate the East, Eastern Orthodox. The Eastern Orthodox will hate the Protestants. The Protestants will hate the, um, the Eastern Orthodox. So there will be and amongst the Christians that accept Isa, there will be others who will reject Isa. Till the day of judgment, they will have enmity amongst them as long as they say we're Christians. One of the, you can say, the divine punishments, if you look at the tafsir of this ayah, one of the divine punishments on the Christians is that they will be put into these sectarian groups vying against one another. Till the day of judgment. And amongst those that call themselves Christians, right, they will be vying against one another, but there will be some that will be more true and some that will be less true to the message of Isa. Those that are more true are closer to the Christianity at the time of the prophet. Those that are less true are away from the Christianity at the time of the Prophet, whom the Quran calls Ahlul Kitab. <clears throat> and what is the number one sifa when you look at the tafsir books? If you look at the tafsir books again, if we go back to some of the tafsir books. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. Um, I will start from here, inshallah. I'll show you another verse. Now, keeping this verse in mind, we'll look at another verse so that the matter is a little bit more clear from two different perspectives. Okay. 
So let us go now to this verse of the Quran. Sorry, trying to bring up a word. I'll just mention the verse if somebody finds the verse, they can bring it up. For some reason, I'm having a hard time scrolling and finding a word. Um, ya Isa, O Isa, inni mutawafika wa mutahiruka min al kafaru. I will purify you from the people that did kufar of you, who the Christians those that are closer to you, that follow you, and I will make those that do kufr of you superior over the ones that rejected you. Now, this ayah has two... Uh, this ayah has two opinions. Allahumma um, salli ala Muhammad. Okay, so those people that follow Jesus will have victory over those people that reject Jesus. This is what the Quran says. So when you look at the room, the, the for Allah is the affair before and after. Number one. Number two, that Allah will give victory to the people that follow Jesus against those who don't follow Jesus in different times According to the situation, Allah will give victory to those people that are closer to Jesus than those that are not. And this is why, for example, Christians always dominated the Jewish people because the Jewish people were the first one to reject Jesus. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dominated what? The Christians over the Jews until it became one civilization, Judeo-Christian civilization. Now the Judeo-Christian civilization is in kufr of is in manifest kufr of Jesus and going into liberalism and everything anti-spiritual. So then a people of Ahlul Kitab who have power will be given power over those people that rejected Isa alayhi salatu wasalam. So I hope uh, I am making this clear. Okay. Now, when we go back, let me try one more time. Try it this way. This is the verse I was talking about. It's called Allahu Ya Isa. And when remember when Allah said, Ya Isa, inni mutawafika, that I will do tawaffa with you which has many different meanings i will complete my promise with you is one of the meanings i will give you death is one of the meanings i will uh, raise you is another meaning it has many meanings okay i will take your soul and then put it back and i will bring you up to me and i will purify you from the people that did kufr and the last and I'll make those who follow you superior until the day of judgment. So there will be a group of Christians that are closer to Jesus than another group of Christians, maybe Judeo-Christian civilization, that are not as close to Jesus. Allah will give the ones that do kufr. Allah will give those people that try to follow Jesus victory over those people that deny Jesus. And the Judeo-Christian civilization is in complete denial of Jesus. And they'll have the victory. So this, now you can understand it in however way you like. But when you add this 
with what Surah Al-Rum is saying. لِلَّهِ الْأَمْرُ مِنْ قَبْلِ وَمِنْ بَعْدِ For Allah is the affair before, when it happened the first time, and min ba'd, and, and the next time when it will happen again. And on that day, the believers will rejoice. This is pointing to the fact that it seems that this will occur again. Something similar like this will occur again in the future. Okay. So now, what are the points I've made so far? Number one, room, the, the, the empire room was not European, not even, not even like half of Europe, right? So again, let me just show that to the brothers and sisters because some people came late and I want this point to be very clear in the minds of the people that the Byzantine empire was not European. Okay, it had only a portion of Europe. It didn't include Britain. It didn't include Germany. It didn't include the Franks, French. It didn't include uh, Poland or any of these areas. It didn't include Spain. Those were different civilizations at that time. But rather the Byzantine Empire was actually North Africa, part of Asia Minor, going into Turkey. The Byzantine Empire was only partly in Europe. It was never fully in Europe. So our room is not the continent of Rome, it is the empire of Rome. It is the empire, empire of the Byzantine. So this has to be clarified between the Quran and the Hadith usage of the word room, which is for the general area, and the Quranic usage of this word, which is referring to an empire. Uh, yes, brother, strategic eschatology. And he follows this up with a very interesting question for which I don't have a perfect answer yet. But the question is, a serious question, but the question is that, well, are you saying then that if the room are Russia, then are you saying that they will be the ones to betray us? Number one. Number two, we know it was NATO and all of America alliances coming together that did the sanctions on Iraq and did sanctions on Syria. So he's saying that there is a mistake here somewhere. Room, when you understand it from this hadith and other hadith like this, room seems to be a continent, a people. Okay, And he's saying if these are the people that the Muslims uh, if, if the, these are the people that put sanctions on Iraq and these are the people that put sanctions on Syria and will further cause problems for the Muslims in the future. So this is his question. And what uh, uh, Sheikh Israr is doing is he's equating the Hadith room to the Quranic room. My response is that that is a, a valid methodology. To look at something, it's valid because you're looking at a word in the hadith and you're joining it with the word in Quran. It's valid, but it then raises questions for me. And the questions it raises for me is that Byzantine was never in Europe. The ones that stopped the sanctions on Iraq and did sanctions on Syria and created all these problems in Syria. They were the NATO alliances together with Turkey even, you know, this whole ISIS thing. And now they're sending ISIS forces in Ukraine to fight against Russia and then claiming that Russia is doing the same. Anyway, I don't want to go into that right now. But the reality from the perspective of historical reality is that Byzantine never represented majority of Europe. But when you look at the Hadith literature, it does seem that there are two different rooms. It seems like there are different levels or different rooms. And the room the Hadith literature is talking about is different. And that room the Quran is talking about is different. And so now we have to understand this room that's all Christian it has some as some aspects, and if you remember, this is very important. Uh, let me share this with you again because it's a very important part of this discussion. And this discussion can go on much longer because well, we could talk about uh, 
the Russian being part of this as, as a big part of this, but I only wanted to leave with a small aspect because there's marriage issues involved. There is a whole bunch of why Russia would be or would not be the legacy of the Byzantine Empire. But even to discuss that, first you have to understand what is a room in Quran and what is a room in the Hadith literature. So that's what we're going to do today because without understanding that, further discussions become futile. Okay, so now if you look here, okay, this line you see here, okay, this line that you're seeing here, this is the line between the, the division between the East and the West. Okay, and so in this sense, in this sense, the Byzantine Empire was not part of Western Europe. It was always part of Eastern Europe. Okay. If it, whatever it was of Europe, it was part of the Eastern Europe. It was never part of Western Europe. But we know from the Hadith literature that some, some things from Western Europe were called Rum. So now let us now discuss that, inshallah ta'ala. So I hope I made this clear that, uh, that what was the Byzantine Empire looking like? And what was its most significant feature in the Hadith literature, in Tafsir literature particularly, when you look at the Byzantine Empire, the most important feature of that group of people, that empire, was, number one, that there were people of the book, and they wanted to promote people of the book. And those people that have been in my previous lectures know the changes that, uh, that Russia is going through for example, that it is becoming very quickly the people of the book, the women doing hijab, three churches a day, right? And you now have the Pope, the patriarch of, uh, that comes from the Eastern Orthodox Church of the Byzantine Empire, that same culture. And you have a political leader and a religious leader working together at a, for a same cause, okay? For the same idea, okay? And so, um, so there is, uh, you can say, can someone be wrong that Russia is the the room, uh, the third Rome, as they call it, in, in those people that espouse to this ideology? Can they be wrong? Of course, we can be wrong. But the main thing you have to consider is that whatever argument we have, we have it through the Quran and through the Hadith, not like our own conjecture we have to understand first what Quran is saying and then understand what the situation is on the ground. It's only when you understand these two things, fiqh al the realities on the ground, with fiqh al-nusus, the understanding of the text. When you have these two, you have to have both of these. You cannot have only understanding of the text and not definitely not a simple understanding of the text. You have to have an understanding of the text. And number two, you have to have, have an understanding of the situation in, with its complexities. Okay, And generally, you know you're kind of right when what you are thinking is not fitting into a cookie cutter. Uh, I don't know if that's making sense to you, but you'll know you're right if there are rules that not everything fits within the rules. Sometimes uh, you have a rule and things fit outside the rule, and that's the nature of, of general rules, okay? Okay, so now let's look at the Hadith literature on this issue. All right, does anyone have any questions so far up to this point? The Byzantine Empire was not representative of Europe. The Hadith literature has used Okay, so number two, Hadith literature has used the word room in general for Europe. And I'll show you the Hadith, uh, some of the sayings of the Prophet on this issue that I think are worth uh, noting. Uh, for example, Sam Ummul Arab. Sam is the father of the Arabs. Waham Abu Habash. And Ham is the father of Ethiopians and Yafith Abu Rum and Yafith is the father of Rome 
Yafid is also the father of Gog and Magog. Okay. This hadith is weak, but there are other ahadiths that say similar things. Okay. So when the Quran is talking about room, it's talking about one aspect of room or a specific aspect of room. When the hadith literature is talking about room, it is talking about a location and a progeny within that location. Okay. Uh, this is another hadith in the book of Jamia of Imam Tirmazi saying the same thing. Sam Abu Arab, Yafid, Abu Rum, Waham, Abu Habash. Okay. So here, Rum has been described by a progeny and the people that live in that land. And uh, if you look at, uh, now here's a hadith that's very interesting that I'd like to share with you. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and this should give you an idea of his openness, his concern and his openness and his way of thinking, the Prophet's way of thinking, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is kind of off topic, but it's related to the topic because a lot of people are like, why should we be concerned about the Ahlul Kitab? Or why should we be concerned about the Romans? So here's another angle the Prophet gives us to look at this situation, okay? The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I wanted to prohibit ghilla. Okay. I was wanting to prohibit men from having relationships with their wives while they're nursing their child. And then the Prophet continues, but the Persians and the Romans did not do it. And therefore, and they did not kill their children, meaning it was not unhealthy. It was un the Prophet thought maybe this is something that when the woman is in a nursing stage, it can affect the child. And the Prophet was concerned about this. But then how was he thinking? He said, well, the Romans do it. There's no issue there. The Persians do it. There's no issue there. So he allowed the men to have intimacy with their wives. Okay. And this is in what? In the chapter of Tib, Kitab Tib. And this is telling you, for example, for issues like medicine, you can look outside the boundaries of just Islamic medicine. You can look at the medicine in the Persian Empire. You can look at the medicine of the Roman Empire. You can look at the medicine of the different. So you have to have this kind of like, Everything is not black and white. There are degrees of black and white. And there are degrees in, like, the way the Prophet dealt with people was very natural. It was not, uh, like, brainwashed occults, you can say. Right? So this hadith also uh, telling us that the Prophet looked at Rome as an example of certain things, certain aspects, even the Persians. So it's not as, yes, of course, there's no doubt. There's absolutely no doubt. Would it be better for Muslims to establish, to work on establishing our own khilafah? Yes, we have to do that regardless. But we have to also realize that the enemy before us who doesn't want us to establish khilafah is so big and we're so weak. We have a hard time praying five times a day. And there's that big giant of liberalism up there with NATO and his forces and his money and his economic system. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings somebody that is not Muslim, but is people of the book who have, you know, similar uh, value system as you to teach them a lesson, this will be psychologically purifying for the Muslims. Let me explain this, what I mean. When the Muslims were in Arabia and they were in Mecca and they were being tortured. And now at that time, at that time of being victimized, the Muslims can point to the Romans and say, they will, those are the people of the book, they're closer to us in value. Those people, they're not Muslims, but they're closer to us in value. They may not be kafir, they may be kafir in the court of Islamic law, 
but they may a lot of them have more nur, more nur in their hearts than many Muslims do. They mm -hmm. believe in their in the in in the good of their in, in they believe in Allah and trust in Allah, some of these non-Muslims more than Muslims do. And so now those non-Muslims, even though Byzantine was treacherous in many ways. But the point is, they were closer to the Muslims. Now, when Muslims defeated the Persians, it was a kind of healing for the Muslims. And if anything, why, why Muslims were so happy that uh, the American forces left Afghanistan? Partly it had to do with beating the arrogance, striking at the arrogance of the West of the Judeo-Christian civilization. So for uh, many Muslims that are in Palestine and in Yemen and in Syria and in different places that have been affected in Iraq, in different places that have been affected by the Judeo-Christian civilization and it's in- uh, Sheikh, um, sorry to interrupt you, but I would like to ask you, is that really relevant? Because the Afghanistan, they still have the Rothschild Bank in their country. Does that really help much? So this is the issue. Because of this, now it is easier for people of Afghanistan to understand, wait, we have the same banking system Russia does, right? So this is like, in many ways, an eye-opener for Muslims that want to see that those that were not able to see, now there's a chance to easily show them, look, this is what will happen if you're part of the system. And that they won't be fair with you. And so, yes, as long as there's a Rothschild bank in Afghanistan, it's a huge problem. And Afghanistan, you know, all of its assets have been frozen. And so now they're in a situation where the, the Muslims who want Islam are in a situation that they can't bring Islam because of this paper money. Well, here's a civilization that's standing up to that paper money and trying to create an alternative. So when Muslims did A, Allah did B for us. Right? You go to Allah walking, he comes to you running. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us that, look, these are the things you need to get rid of. And that means that you have to separate yourself from the Judeo-Christian civilization. You have to se separate yourself from NATO and America uh, financially and in all other ways so that you're not under the same, uh, you know, that we press a button and all your banks are closed. So in that way, it is relevant because these people that are Ahlul Kitab, if you read what they're writing, what their thinkers are saying, if you read like deeply what they're saying, there are the one key word that they're, the Moscow thinkers and analysts keep writing about is they don't want liberalism in Russia. That's the one key thing that across the board, they don't want that liberalism. As long as you have this system in place, you have that culture in place. You have that culture that promotes indecency, that culture, at least, okay, if Russia is strong, then at least that.